In today's episode, we carry on from last week going over the digestion starter pack. We also find out why aloe vera can make you have explosive diarrhea, why Quest bars are the best, and why most green powders suck. But make sure that you subscribe and share this with a friend, and we'll catch you on the inside. Alex, I feel like people are very particular about this one thing, and it's something that I'm not particular about at all. It's really just what I feel in the moment. Do you sleep with your socks on or off? My opinion on this has actually been changing lately. I used to be big on the socks off, but as of late, I've been sleeping with my socks on, and it's been an enjoyable experience. I've been sleeping okay with my socks on, which I thought previously was a detriment to my sleep. But um, turns out it's not so bad. What about you? I just, I mean, I go with the flow. What I'm feeling that night, if I'm feeling socks off, I take my socks off. If I'm feeling socks on, I leave them on. I don't have like a hard and fast rule. I think it depends on how exposed our bed is to the coldness of the room temperature. So like if we, so we're not huge on making our bed. This is just not our, our norm. I don't think that it's necessary for you to make your bed. We aren't consistently in our bedroom. It's just one of the, like we wake up, we brush our teeth, go to the bathroom. I don't see the bedroom again until I'm going to bed normally. And we're night. not always getting up at the exact same yeah. time. So what am I going to do? Like make the bed with you in it or <laughs> vice versa? Like that's not going to happen. Right. So just to put it out there, bed's not made. Thus the sheets themselves get exposed to what is 67 degrees for the room temperature. And so it can get super icy in there. And in those instances, I like to have socks on. But like what type of socks also? I I don't really, I I don't think I could do like fuzzy warm socks. But like not footy socks either, right? Probably not footy socks. Probably just like my normal like stance socks that I wear. Fair, fair, fair. Yeah. Okay. You agree? Okay. That's all I had on socks. (laughs) (laughs) Let's dig in to today's topic. If you guys listened to the last episode, episode 105, we got into tier one and tier two of our digestion starter pack. We talked about habits. We talked about what else? (laughs) We We talked about routine. We talked about posture, breathing, stress, sleep, all the things that are foundational to you getting into a better position within your digestion. And today we're going to get into tier three and tier four, which is going to include our nutrition and is going to include some supplementation that we have found within our clients, as well as through research to show benefit within your digestion as a whole. So tier three is food. Let's get rolling with what that entails. Yes. And then last week, we also talked about what is good and bad Mm. digestion. So if you have confusion on what it means of do you have good or bad digestion, then definitely give that last episode a listen as well. But digging into food. So since we have addressed that routines and habits, as well as looking into the posture, stress, breathing, if you're still having issues after you've addressed those, then we can go ahead and take a look into food. Whereas we talked about in last episode, a lot of people turn to food first and they think I need to do an elimination diet. I need to take all of this food out, but it could be something as simple as how fast you're eating or how thoroughly you're chewing your food. But if you've done those and you're still experiencing experiencing digestive distress, then we can dive into what you're eating and not only how you, what food you're sourcing, but also looking at how you're allotting your macros throughout the day, the distribution, as well as looking at some different uh, factors within fiber and then also looking at food sourcing. Right. And when we talk about those lifestyle factors, it's not just a matter of trying it for two or three days and be like, oh, this isn't working for me. Like some of the things that we talked about needs consistent effort. I would say all the things that we talked about need consistent effort. And I think that if you are implementing a a multitude of those different things from a lifestyle perspective, it's best for you to probably do it for three to four weeks consistently, day in and day out, to really assess if it's been a help for you or there is a benefit that you have seen from utilizing them. Now, the first thing that we'll talk about from a food perspective is going to be the distribution of those macronutrients. Because the macronutrients that we're speaking about being protein, carbohydrates, and fats, there are going to be, uh, the protein itself is going to be the hardest to digest as a whole. It's the hardest to break down as there's more to it, if you will, than just simply 
I don't even know what the right verbiage would be, but it is more difficult for it to be digested. So this is going to be the one that we want to see probably the greatest disbursement when we're talking about digestion. Yeah. And if you have a physique goal as well, having even protein distribution is going to be much more optimal for muscle growth. Uh, so what I always recommend is just to take your average amount of meals that you eat in a day. For myself, it's four. And then let's say you have 100 grams of protein, just so it's easy math for me on the spot, then I would recommend having 25 grams of protein per meal. And what we see with that skewed distribution pattern, that would be, okay, I have 10 grams in one meal, 70 grams in another, 50 15 and another, 20 and another. And we do need 20 to 25 grams of protein to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So I always like to look at meals as protein feedings of, okay, I need to hit that threshold of that 20 to 25 grams. And looking at it in that way is really helpful so I can break it down. Because like you said, each person is going to have their own struggle when it comes to the amount of protein they digest. And for me, that's getting upwards of 45 or 50 grams per a meal. That makes it really hard for my digestion, especially depending on what the type of protein is. Because if I'm looking at something like steak that has a lot of connective tissue, it is just harder to digest because you have to chew it more, then that might be something that eating 40 or 50 grams of protein in that one sitting feels much different than maybe having 40 grams of protein from like a protein powder, which is much easier to digest as long as for me personally, it does not have dairy in it. So being able to take those different factors into consideration is going to be really helpful. Could you give the listeners an example of what that means for you in the sense that it does not digest well? What are some of the symptoms or feelings that you have to really illustrate to you that it's not digesting well? Yeah. Well, one factor is that protein is going to be a major driver when it comes to satiation. And so it's going to be much more filling. So if I'm having a meal that's having that higher amount of protein in it, first, I also have to take into account what the other macros are, because I kind of have a threshold for how many calories I can eat in one sitting without feeling not so great. So I will just feel more fullness, which fullness isn't bad, but if it is paired with too much food, then it can have just an uncomfortable feeling. So I just feel like my, not that there's a rock in my stomach, but I can tell like there's too much trying to digest and I can feel that like heaviness in my stomach. And sometimes that can cause like a lot more gas or just discomfort or cramping depending on what the situation is. Yes. And, and I think that the other macronutrient, well, all three are going to be important to have equal disbursement. I think that the easiest way to go about it is just to have equal disbursement of all macronutrients across maybe four meals or however you're splitting it up. It's probably the simplest way to make it work. Because if you have potentially too much fats in a single sitting, this can also send your digestion going the opposite direction as well. Probably looser stools and those different factors. If you have, let's say, 60 fat in a day and you have fat hoarded uh, mm -hmm. for the evening, because I know that I've had clients of mine who have really struggled with this, where they feel as though that their fats are so minimal relative to the quantity numerically of their carbohydrates and their proteins that they're like, I just, I, I don't want to go over on my fats. So they eat super low fat and then they get to the evening and they're like, oh my gosh, I have 40 fat still left because I ate nothing but chicken and egg whites all morning and then rice. And so then they try to make up that difference and have something extremely fat dense in the evening, which generally leads to them having looser stools in the morning or in the evening or their stomach being uncomfortable going to bed or what have you. And so making that equal disbursement is probably going to be the most gentle on your digestion digestive system uh, as a whole. Yeah. And you don't have to keep it perfectly equal throughout your whole life. It's something that, especially if someone's having issues with digestion or issues with consistently hitting their macros, that's always something I pull up is, hey, let's evenly distribute them. So we really just get things going. And then we can kind of break down. Because for myself, I found that having my my two first meals of the day are my bigger meals calorically. And then my second two meals are a little bit less. And that's just what I found that works with me, how my training schedule is. So it's not that my macros are perfectly distributed throughout the day. But it's really looking at, hey, if I'm struggling with this, and I can't get this down, what's the easiest way for me to go about this? So instead of having to play macro Tetris, and figuring out how everything fits, you can easily just divide it and know how that fits together.
And so let's let's talk about fiber allotment and distribution of that, because I think that that's the next thing that we would want to really dig into. And with fiber, it's something that is going to be very dependent on how much we can consume per sitting, because this is another one where if we're consuming too much in a single sitting, this is going to cause a lot of distension and stomach discomfort more often than not, especially if the individual is uh, not accustomed to having a, a higher quantity of fiber day to day. I think that the easiest example for me to give is going back in time and telling a little bit of a story about me consuming Quest Bars. And You're Quest Bars- You're going to hurt Miguel's feelings here. <laughs> with Quest Bars, I believe they're, are there 14, 14 grams per bar. Mm-hmm. And um, early on in my fitness journey, I was consuming two of those in a singular sitting- And those were terrorizing my stomach, but I wasn't really connecting the dots. I was just looking at the total protein allotment because it was 20 grams per bar or whatever it was. Um, And so that at the beginning was a little bit of an issue for me, but I just continued because all, again, all I was concerned about with was with the protein and my body did adapt over time to being able to navigate through that. Or I just normalized the discomfort. (laughs) One or the other, something happened and I continued to do it. And so we want to have an even disbursement of fiber as best as we possibly can, um, trying not to just be like, oh my gosh, again, hoarding that fiber like we were with the fats earlier of, I need to get another 10 or 20 grams in and I've only got one meal left. So I'm just going to try to get all of it in right here. It's like in those scenarios, just for your guys' knowledge, it's probably just best to do what you you would normally do for a regular meal rather than trying to play catch up and just take the L for the evening and then have a better plan for the day moving forward. Yeah, I'm with fiber. If you're wondering, well, how much fiber should I have per day? The recommended daily amount is going to be 10 to 14 grams per 1,000 calories. So this is something I always point out to clients, especially if their food is changing, whether they're in a deficit or they are in a surplus or at maintenance, is letting them know their fiber number is going to change. Because I've had clients come to me and they're like, I feel my best around 20 grams of fiber. But that might be when they're at a place where they're eating around 2,000 calories. And then when they go down, they're having problems going to the bathroom, or when they go up, they are having a little bit too much of an ease going to the bathroom. And so being able to know that that is going to be, again, a recommendation. And with these like RDAs, you always want to kind of start from that and then see what feels best for you. So for myself, I normally feel better on the lower end of fiber. And that can be difficult because I really enjoy foods that have fiber in it. But I have seen just from clients overall, it's It's not just hitting the right amount of fiber per day, as that's going to be a big part of it, and staying from day to day within a good threshold instead of going from like 14 to 40 from a Monday to Tuesday. But like you said, just how it's distributed. And protein bars are one that I look for big time or just a lot of diet foods. Because one thing we do within clients, regardless of if they've been tracking macros or if they're trying to hit certain macros, is taking a look at food logs because we can like gain a lot of information about a client and their digestion through that. And I recently just reviewed a client's food logs and she had a few different protein bars. So the Kirkland protein bars are like the, they're just, they're the exact same as the Quest bars. Um, And there was a few other ones in the thing with a lot of protein bars is they have added fiber in there. And so it's not necessarily fiber from whole sources. It's just like supplemented in because they know people need some more fiber in place. And so she would be having like 15 plus grams of fiber in one sitting. She'd be feeling uh, bloated and have like pain, have a hard time going to the bathroom and being struggling with it. And she didn't realize it because she was like, oh, I'm getting fiber in or even just like these low carb tortillas that were super high in fiber. And it was causing her days to literally go like 14 grams one day of like she didn't have a protein bar or didn't have the tortillas and the next day it's like 45 and that's really confusing for your gut because there are two types of fiber and that's going to play a role of how your digestion goes because fiber is going to help your digestion but with those two types it can either slow it down or speed it up depending on what you're consuming right and i think that by utilizing the food logs it's another way for you to just what gets tracked gets measured and what just gets kind of input and kind of wished away. You're just not keeping tabs on. And so it's a better way for you to have an understanding of the quality of foods that you're taking in, as well as maybe giving you better insight in terms of 
why you're feeling the way that you're feeling. Because it could be something where you are not taking that food log and then you're in a position of like, I'm just, I'm uncomfortable and you're just taking kind of like a, a shot at the dark, a shot in the dark at what's going on. But by having the food logs, it gives you more visibility of what could be the issue, if you will. Yeah. And just like with you talking about you having those two quest bars that you just didn't even put two and two together, if you were looking and reviewing some food logs, you could have seen of, oh, I, when I'm having this, this is when my discomfort is coming. So if you already track your food in an app, whether it's my fitness pal or another app, you can always go back and reflect and you can even put notes in my fitness pal but what i also recommend is just using the notes app on your phone and 30 to 60 minutes after you eat a meal just making a note of how you feel like hey i went and had explosive diarrhea after this meal <laughs> or hey i feel great i feel like i had good hunger cues i had good energy after this because like we talked about um, in the last episode of just you might feel really lethargic after a meal and so being able to even notate that is going to be so helpful Helpful for you to just be able to keep track of where things are going. And this came in place with a client of mine as well. Um, this also goes in line with the macro allotment or distribution is that I was looking at her food logs. She had great like spread out throughout the day, but then it got to her last meal and she was macro hoarding as a whole. And she was intaking like 100 carbs in that last meal, like 20 grams of fat, just because she felt like she would get to the end of the day and she was scared she was going to be hungry. And so we ended up dispersing that throughout the day while still having like some good food that she could have at the end of the day and be excited about. And not only did her digestion improve, her hunger cues improved because she wasn't so hungry all day leading into that. And then she was also able to have better energy in the gym um, and just better results as a whole by just dispersing her food and not having that time. And just by reviewing those food logs, we are able to really see, hey, this one thing you can change and you're going to feel a lot better. Right. And, and I think that by having those food journals, it allows for us to see food sourcing and understanding the quality of nutrients that we're taking in and where we can probably be a little bit better. Because I think that we can always probably increase the quality of the nutrients that we're taking in, whether that be incorporating more fruits and vegetables into our diet, uh, selecting better quality of protein sources and those different factors that are going to aid in our overall digestion. Yeah. And when we're looking at those like processed and high fat foods are going to also cause some discomfort. And so being able to see, hey, like you said, the quality of how this is uh, laid out in my day to day. And something I like to talk about as well are FODMAP. So I know I mentioned an elimination diet before. And while I'm not the most fond of doing these just because they are really restrictive and if I can not do that with a client. I will choose to not do that with a client. But going at FOD, going with FODMAPs are going to allow us to take a look and see, hey, are we consuming things that are really high irritants versus low irritants? So um, you can look up a list online, just search FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P, and it'll show you high and low FODMAP foods. And so let's say that a client eats a ton of garlic and everything else is all in a good spot. And then they see, hey, garlic is a really high FODMAP, it could be an irritant. Instead of having to go all the way to the bare bones and then build things up, let's take out a few of these high FODMAP things, see how you're feeling, and then we can add them back one by one. So it's a little bit less strict and less extreme as a full elimination diet, and it can reap very similar results if you go about it in the right way. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Speaking of the FODMAP, a little bonus tip here that I have clients utilize. This is a, a vegetable mash. With the vegetable mash, what I have them do is take five to six vegetables that they um, have either had to eliminate or they would like to incorporate into their diet. I have them cut them into really small pieces, put them in the refrigerator, blend them, don't juice them, 
but just blend them together into that mash. And then as the days go on each day, you can have as little of, of just a, a tablespoon. Um, but wait, work your way up to maybe a cup of that mash as you work to incorporate that food into your diet just on a day-to-day basis. And what this is going to do is increase butyrate, which is going to be a product of aiding in nourishing that good bacteria in your gut and allowing for the fiber to be better digested. So this is a great way for you to incorporate those foods over time in very small quantities to allow for your digestion to better respond to these vegetables moving forward. Yeah. And another thing is I would recommend looking into episode 39 of the podcast where we talk about low appetite. And this can be great to figure out what foods are just easier to digest. So even if you don't have a low appetite, this podcast episode really talks through what foods are going to be the easiest to digest. Like I gave the example of steak being possibly more difficult. Something like a white fish is going to be very easy to digest or a ground chicken. So you can go and take a look or listen to that podcast podcast to be able to learn a little bit more about just easier on your digestion as a whole. And the last thing we'll talk about from a nutrition standpoint is going to be meal timing because for us to have the best digestion possible, we have to give our gut a break. We cannot just be constantly having input more food, more food, more food. It's like, we need to be able to rest and digest to allow for the gut to optimally perform. And so is there a time window that you often have clients uh, keep between meals? I say at least two hours between meals to give yourself that rest, especially if you're going to bed, finishing your food, not starting your last meal two hours before bed, but finishing your last meal two hours before bed. And I notice this in myself when I get into a snacking mood, and I don't want to demonize snacking. Snacking is still very much okay on your fitness journey. If you have, if you're figuring out your gut, it's just figuring out how to snack. And so with that, if you end up like finishing a meal, and then you're just having small bites of things all in between until the next meal, your stomach really didn't get a chance to rest. And then when you go to eat that next meal, you could already be in like discomfort, or you could put yourself in more discomfort by eating that meal, because you never really gave your stomach a chance to rest in between everything. Right. And I think that that is huge as well as understanding your hunger signaling. By having true meal timing, you're not just constantly feeding of like, I'm, I'm a little hungry, I'm just gonna go eat right now. And then you're just constantly staying in this like grazing state where you're never actually getting fully satiated, nor ever actually getting fully hungry. You're just kind of in this middle ground, which is very annoying for your, for your mind, as well as it's not helping your digestion as we talked about today. So that kind of wraps up the nutritional component. Now we dig into supplementation. Supplementation is a beast when it comes to digestion because there's a lot of claims, there's a lot of different supplements that are recommended, and we're gonna give you guys a glimpse because it would be a five-hour podcast (laughs) if we were to dig into every supplement, the research behind it, and so on and so forth. So I picked a handful that I think are going to be beneficial for us to have conversation on today and get into the the depths of, if you will, but um, it could be, there's a lot there. So I'm excited (laughs) to dig in. Um, Do you have anything to kind of kick us off with because like testing and those different factors? There could be an issue with your stomach acid, and we can get into this a little bit more, but if you just Google the stomach acid test, it's going to be able to show you how to use baking soda to figure out if you do have low acidity in your stomach. So you can go ahead and search like the baking soda test or the stomach acid test, and that should pop up. And it's a really easy thing to do when you're fasted and to be able to figure out, hey, am I having an issue with my stomach acid here? Now, another thing we want to take into consideration is your medication. And we are not going to go through every single medication and talk about how it could affect your digestion, but it is something that is worth looking into for yourself. So there are going to be different medications that are going to deplete certain electrolytes or just a side effect might be some digestive distress. So being able to look at that, talking to your doctor and seeing what's the best course of action for you is going to be best bet there, but it is very much so worth mentioning in this because medication 
medication can have such an effect on us depending on what the medication is. And then you could have like an, a digestive issue, something like an IBS, an IBD, celiac, or Crohn's. And this is going to be something that is going to be diagnosed by a gastroenterologist. So we cannot diagnose that for you right now. Uh, but if you do feel like, hey, I've gone through all of this, I'm still having such issues with my gut, then it might be looking at a specific food sensitivity or being able to look at a digestive issue as a whole. So I would recommend if you've had like lifelong issues, you've applied all of these for multiple weeks and you're still struggling to go and see a gastroenterologist. The last disclaimer we'll make before we get into the supplements is that we all have some degree of leaky gut, some more significantly than others, but the GI tract is not completely impenetrable. <laughs> what a word, <laughs> impenetrable. So a number of these supplements that we are going to speak on today are going to be aiding in strengthening that mucosal lining. This is one of the major components of the digestive tract. We're gonna talk about this more as we get into the supplements, but uh, we've got really three main walls, if you will, to the digestive tract and the mucosal lining is a very important piece of that. Um, and within these supplements, a lot of these are going to be herbal as well as ut utilized more in, in Chinese medicine and those different factors. And so what we will see is that a lot of anecdote and, and those different factors being utilized to back these products rather than it being something that is 100% looked at from a scientific literature perspective. And there's many components that go into that, but I did want to make that statement as there's always going to be more research that's necessary to continue to strengthen uh, the, the benefit and the legitimacy of some of these products that we speak to today. And, and we'll outline those as we get to them. Perfect. So what's starting us off here for supplements? The first one, I think, to start is going to be fiber. Because when we look at fiber, this is something that maybe a lot of individuals find themselves in a situation where they don't enjoy foods that are fiber dense. And so they or reach for a fiber supplement. And so this can be a very useful tool to supplement with fiber, but we want to make sure that the profile itself is, is more useful than, than not, if you will. We have two forms of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Now soluble is able to dissolve in water, and with soluble, this is more going to be a part of your day-to-day -day diet. It's going to be much easier to find. But insoluble is not going to be as easy to find within your diet. And this is going to have a greater impact on the overall digestive tract and getting things moving as a whole. So the uh, insoluble fiber is going to have a greater promotion of overall bowel movements and uh, prevention of overall constipation. But can certainly be overdone, so something to keep in mind on that front, and is still going to have the recommendation from us that we talked about within the RDA of having 10 to 14 grams per thousand calories, but utilizing that as just a simple reference point rather than it being something that is like, I have to get 14 grams, I have to get 10. It's one of those situations where listen to your body, understand where your bowel movements are at, how you're feeling, how food is feeling like it's digesting, and going from there to really figure out the quantity of fiber that you need to have from a day-to-day -day perspective. When we talk about supplementing with a fiber powder, it's not going to be something that tastes all that great. When I talk about the insoluble fiber and it not being able to dissolve in water, it's going to feel, or it's going to have an interesting texture to a drink. It's not going to be like, mm, delicious. <laughs> it's gonna be like, Tasty. that tastes like soggy oats. I don't, that doesn't taste <laughs> that grainy. great. Little grainy. Little grainy. So keep that in mind. Um, don't expect for yourself to, to get one and then just keep shaking it and somehow it's going to dissolve because it's not going to. If it is the insoluble fiber, which a majority of your uh, powdered fiber products are going to be that insoluble fiber um, or have a greater quantity of them. So just something to keep in mind as you reach for fiber supplementation, if that's something you're needing to utilize. Do you have a certain one that you recommend to clients? I have a handful, or not a handful, I have one from Revive that I really like. They have seven grams per serving and five of those being soluble, um, or I'm sorry, insoluble fiber, and then two grams of soluble fiber. And I find that for clients that struggle with getting fiber in as a whole, it's a great product. It's easy to mix in because they do have it flavored. I think that it's like mocha and there's maybe another flavor, but I there's do like chocolate, the, I believe, yeah, maybe it's like mocha and chocolate and maybe there's a berry. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, I know that I've had, I think the 
I want to say chocolate, but yeah. I, I want to say, I don't know if they carry that anymore now that we say that out loud. <laughs> Uh, well, another great one to get from the grocery store is getting psyllium husk. And this is one that's going to be one-to-one and soluble-to-soluble fiber. But if you're just wanting to get it at your grocery store, you can normally find it. Sometimes it's going to be over in the supplement area as a whole, but that's going to be one that is going to be pretty natural overall. That's not going to be just a bunch of additives, but that's a great route to go. And we do recommend you get most of it from food because it is going to feel a little bit different based on how you get your fiber in. And just to give you some of our favorite fiber sources or ways to get fiber in, uh, oats are a great one. Raspberries are a top one for me. Love me some freaking raspberries. Popcorn is another top one for me. Uh, Black beans are a great one. Uh, What are some of your favorite sources of fiber? You've said them all, to be honest with you. (laughs) Uh, Any kind of like blackberry, raspberry, um, those are going to have good amounts of fiber in them. Um, So I normally gravitate gravitate towards, I have a serving of oats a day, I have a serving of raspberries, I normally have some sort of popcorn, and then being able to get small amounts from protein bars. So like a Nash bar has a few grams, and it's going to be like from the dates and from um, like natural, because it's all natural ingredients, uh, or something like an RX bar because of the different nuts um, and everything. Those normally have like seven grams of fiber. So those are great options to go with. I believe that midday squares have four to six grams of fiber as well. So I normally hit my fiber pretty easily just from from those few. Excellent. The next supplement is probiotics. My gosh, probiotics are are vast. We could spend an entire episode, maybe like a three-part series if we were to go over the different strains um, and giving you guys mechanistically how Uh, probiotics work. It's such a growing body of literature to begin with. And something that I think as the the years go on, we're going to be able to see some really cool things come from that category of research as as a whole. So that's exciting stuff. But I did want to highlight one strain that I do push forward a a lot of times in specific cases. And, And in these specific cases, what is being shown through research is that during a time of utilizing an antibiotic and then following the time of utilizing an antibiotic is a really good time to supplement with a probiotic as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so to quickly talk on the antibiotic portion of things is that the antibiotic is going to remove the bacteria or, or the, um, I guess, yeah, remove the bacteria and uh, allow for whatever the illness or whatever it's trying to remove out of the system. Alongside of it, it is going to take the good bacteria that we need from a gut health perspective. It's it's not able to just be like, you, you, and you, you're coming with me. I'm going to leave everyone else here. See you guys later. It's removing everything. And so we want to be understanding of that. And so how we can nourish that bacteria is utilizing quality probiotics. Now, it's not just going to your local grocery store and picking up a bottle that says probiotic on it, because like I said, there's so many different strains and there's so many different quantities of those strains and those different factors that we have to pay attention to. And so the one strain that I really like to recommend to clients is S. Bilardi. Now with this, it is a non-pathogenic yeast microbe. Now the beauty of this is where you gain so much benefit from it is that because of the yeast, it is so resilient in the moments that a lot of these probiotics fall short. And what I mean by that is that it is resilient to body temperature. So it's able to travel down the digestive tract. It's also resilient to acidity. And so those are the two main factors why a lot of these probiotics don't actually reach the gut because they are not resilient to that body temperature and they're not resilient to overall acidity. And so when we're in a state of utilizing those antibiotics, it's a good thing for us to take a probiotic such as this one to allow for us to nourish and restore that good bacteria to allow for our gut health to be in a more prime position. Because our gut health, as we've talked about, is going to have a role in so many different factors from an energy production standpoint within your mood, obviously digesting and absorbing foods and those different factors. And so utilize something like S. Bilardi is going to be helpful for us um, during a time of antibiotic use and then following the antibiotic antibiotic use. 
Now, one thing to say with this is that it does build up in the system. So it's not something that I would recommend just taking on end. Like you're not going to need to consistently take it over time, but in specific scenarios, it is a good option to have in place. And if you are experiencing, and we're not getting into like deeper symptoms of, of leaky gut and those different factors, but if you are someone who is having more uh, symptoms or, or more drastic symptoms, I should say, keeping this in the regimen every, like you take it for four to six weeks, have a break, I would say maybe like two or three months and then have it back into the protocol would be a good window. Maybe even shorter than that, it's going to be dependent on what your symptom at, symptoms are as well as your guidance of what they recommend and those different factors. I'm giving general recommendations here, but do you have anything to touch on from a, a probiotic perspective? Well, I'm really glad that you mentioned something like antibiotics, especially with us mentioning medication earlier, because you might be on a medication consistently due to whatever it may be, but you might also be on something temporarily like antibiotics, or I know like prednisone does a number on my digestion. And so if you're on something that is temporary, yes, like for antibiotics, you can counteract it to a certain degree or just help yourself along there with having the, the probiotics in place, but being able to keep in mind if you're in a moment of like, I'm having to take this medication just for like this week, I might just have worse digestion for this week and not think, oh my gosh, everything is over. And those are times where I really encourage clients to hone in on just being so good with their food. So for myself, I even know like around my cycle, my digestion gets a little bit worse. And so I am so on it of like, I'm not going to have eat my meals too close together. I'm not going to eat too close to bed. I'm not going to eat foods that kind of irritate my stomach, but I can normally get away with it. I'm going to go in the way of, hey, I'm already going to have some variables off, so I'm going to make my other inputs as consistent as possible to make sure that I feel my best. Excellent. The next supplement is probably going to be the one that you guys hear the most about, I feel like. I feel like probiotics are commonly talked about or more abundantly talked about, but I feel like L-glutamine is probably the most talked about, at least at this moment, to help with gut health as a whole. And I think there's a, a couple of different reasons why that is the case. I think that one, it is inexpensive being a big part of it from a, a purchasing standpoint, as well as there's very, very little to no side effects to it. So if someone does implement L-glutamine, they find themselves in a situation that they're either having benefit or it's just null and void. And so those are my favorite types of supplements oh, yeah. to, 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 to put that. into place <laughs> because it's one of those situations where it's like we either see benefit or we see ourselves in a situation where it may just be nothing and that's okay. And we tried it and we saw if we had benefit or not. And so glutamine may improve digestion by strengthening the intestinal barrier by reducing intestinal intestinal permeability. And permeability here is just the quality of a material to allow liquids or gases to pass through it. So it's allowing for us to have greater transportation of the nutrients and liquids and those different factors that we're taking in. It is also going to aid in strengthening the tight junctions. And what the tight junctions are going to do internally are barriers between cells to restrict diffusion of liquids. And then it is also going to promote entocerocyte growth. And this ensures that we are uh, f are able to uptake ions, water, nutrients, vitamins, and absorb uh, bile salts. So in terms of what glutamine is doing for us in the body is a beautiful thing. It's doing a lot of things. And so if you just were to listen to the, the benefits that we're gaining from this, it's like, hell yes, I'm going to supplement with this. This is something that I should definitely be supplementing with. But the catch here is, is that glutamine is going to be extremely abundant within our food, provided that we're taking in quality protein sources. And so for example, for 100 grams of beef, so just slightly under four ounces of beef, you are going to be getting roughly 1.2 grams of glutamine there. And so when we get into the dosages of the glutamine, this is going to be helpful for us as you know, that's a, a big quantity of what we would recommend from a total dosage on a day-to-day -day perspective. So if we're taking in quality protein sources, supplementing with L-glutamine may not be necessary, but again, it's something where 
it's either going to be of benefit to supplement or null and void. So again, it could be advantageous for you. Um, when we talk about glutamine, it is the preferred source of those interserocytes that we just talked about, as well as those lymphocytes. And if you know anything about lymphocytes, this is extremely important from an immune function standpoint. And so again, just the laundry list of benefits, it's like, bro, I gotta get this into my routine. Um, do you have anything to add for L-glutamine? I do. There are still more benefits to talk about. Crazy, <laughs> crazy town. So it's also going to act as an anti-inflammatory. And anti-inflammatories, when it comes to your gut, is just very helpful because if your gut is inflamed, it's going to be much harder to move things through. And so it's going to have those factors of having that anti-inflammatory, and it's going to help produce glutathione, which this is going to be your body's principal antioxidant. So we definitely want that in place. So when we talk about dosage, like Alex said, for a little bit less than four ounces of beef, you're getting 1.2 grams. And what we're really looking for here when it comes to glutamine is five to 10 grams that we're doing within dosaging. But there has been studies shown that even upwards of 50 or 60 grams didn't show any negative return. So again, a great safe supplement to go with of even if you do go up to that 50 or 60 and maybe we don't even get benefits to that point, you're still not going to have a negative impact, which is why I love being able to have like a safe, cheaper supplement to be able to give as a try of let's go ahead and try this out before we go for something maybe a little bit more pricey because probiotics can get very pricey. Fiber supplements are normally very um, well priced overall, but I always want to take the client into mind and I'm not just going to say, hey, take this laundry list of supplements that's going to cost you a few hundred dollars where if I can do it with less supplements or I can do it without certain supplements, I'm always going to go that route just just to make it the best for the client. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. The next supplement we have on our list here is zinc carnison. Now, this is a, a relatively new molecule and a developing body of research as a whole. It is a chelated compound that contains L-carnosine and zinc. Zinc is an essential mineral that is vital in immune function, cell growth, and wound healing. Carnison is a dipeptide that is known for its ability to support healthy gut function and aids in the protection against oxidative stress. What a beautiful combination. Truly. What a helpful combination of things that we have there. A number of studies have showcased restoration of gastric lining, decrease of GI irritation, improving overall GI and taste disorders, and being a very helpful hand in healing other parts of the, the GI tract. As I said, it's a growing body of literature. People are very excited about this product as a whole. Um, it is already a, a patented form uh, of of the, of the uh, product called Pepsin GI. So when you're looking for this particular product, I don't think that people could just sell it as uh, zinc carnison without it being the patented form. But if you do just see zinc carnison and then you turn it around to the supplement facts and don't see that Pepsin GI, I would just put it back on the shelf and find a better quality patented form. Um, when we look at the utilization of this particular supplement, uh, the absorption with, with it is going to be most effective on an empty stomach. But one thing that we do know within uh, zinc consumption as a whole is that zinc can cause some stomach discomfort. And so if you are not currently supplementing with zinc, and are wanting to bring this product into your protocols, it's probably best that you introduce it with food and maybe go a couple of weeks utilizing it with food and then trying it fasted, seeing if you have any stomach discomfort. If you do, go back to taking it with food because when we talk about best scenario, that's always going to be the case of like what our approach is. Yes, this is best by literature, but what is actually the best for you? Like, can your gut handle taking this in a fasted state? Yes, awesome. You align with the literature of what's going to be the most optimal situation, but you may be in a group that's not necessarily what's been researched, if you will. And so that's going to be an important part when we talk about utilizing uh, this supplement 
as I talked about, it is a, a patented form of Pepsin GI. And when you turn that bottle around and see the supplement facts, when we talk about dosage, they're going to have them split. And so it's going to be zinc by itself, and then it's going to be the carnosine by itself. And so what we recommend from a dosage standpoint to get started with is going to be eight milligrams of zinc, and then roughly 30 milligrams of the carnosine. I think that within the patented form, it's like... It's, uh, 29 or something like that. It's it's something in that ballpark. It's not a perfect number. And I wanted to put a perfect number in here. So <laughs> on brand. Exactly. Do you have anything within that product? I'm not sure. Do you have any clients that use it or anything like that? I've had clients that have used it in the past and seen some good response from it. And one thing I like to note with it is just how much like immune function and digestion is so intertwined. And we also talked about like the uh, gut brain access of like your mental health and what's going on up here can really determine what's going on in your digestive tract. And it's the same with your immune function. And that's why in the last episode, when we talked about stress, that plays such a role because if you're super stress and you're feeling it in your in your mind, that's not only going to affect your gut, but that stress can also put you in a place where you have an elevated heart rate, like we also talked about, can cause some digestive distress and not putting you in that rest and digest place that we want to be. But having that stress can also lower your immune system function. And so if you have really high stress, then that could cause your immune system to be downregulated, your um, mental headspace causing problems within your gut. And so being able to take a look at how these things are intertwined and understanding why you would take a supplement or why you would change something is so helpful. Because if I just say, take this, your digestion's going to be better. You might take it and you might be like, oh yeah, my digestion feels better. But if you don't understand why, then that's really hard to continue to take it or even understand why you should continue to take it. And so being able to understand the factors that go into it, i find so helpful for just knowing how it fits into my routine, when I might need to pull it out, or when it might be something that I personally need to work on instead of taking another supplement, I might need to manage my stress better and be able to support my immune system by doing so. Right. And I, I, I think that that touches on a really cool point is that we're talking about specific ingredients of supplements to add to your protocols. We're not giving you, here's this blend of ingredients from these different brands. You should take this product because when we talk about digestive health in general, it is so complex and it's very challenging to put yourself in a situation where you incorporate a product that has five or six ingredients, it works, but you don't really know what in there is working for you. And so you kind of feel um, shackled to, without a better word there. I mean, that that word. Right, shackled to that product to make sure that your digestion continues to be uh, good. And so that's something to keep in mind and and incorporating, just as we talked about within the, the sleep episode of supplementation is that incorporating single ingredients first to see what really benefits you. And then maybe you'll be able to find a product that incorporates all the ingredients that uh, work for you in one single product. The next two products that I'm going to speak on are the the two that I I spoke on a little bit earlier uh, about the utilization in Chinese medicine and those different factors not having a ton of backing from a literature standpoint. And so the first one is going to be aloe vera. Now, with aloe vera, how have you used aloe vera throughout your life? Um, <laughs> For <there's>, sunburns. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a jack of all trades. I have. But do not think that you can take the aloe vera from like what you would put on a sunburn and ingest it. Please, before we go further, do not think that you can just take a little pump of that and throw it in your mouth. That is not what we are saying here. It is an ingredient in that, and it is going to play a role, but it's not the same. (laughs) Yes. So aloe vera is a jack of all trades. It's used for a variety of different reasons throughout Indian and Chinese medicine, alongside many industries in Western society, um, as we talked about within the, the skincare and all those different aspects. It has 75 active components, including a variety of vitamins, minerals, saccharides, amino acids, enzymes, and the list just continues to go on. The enzymes help break down sugars and fats, and aloe vera as a whole is believed to be helpful in keeping the digestive system running smoothly alongside decreasing irritation to the stomach and the intestines. With that belief, 
I have had clients utilize this product and have had success. They swear by it. They feel very confident that it has been a big, helpful piece to improving their digestion. There is very limited research on its overall efficacy. And I think that there's a number of reasons why this could be the case. Maybe um, financial backing or, or potentially interest in terms of collecting the data because one of the most recent piece of literature that I found was from 2006. And this paper was a three-month randomized control trial of 58 patients with IBS. And after the three months, they found no significant change or suggestion that aloe vera was beneficial in improving IBS symptoms in those different aspects. But being someone with IBS, being able to articulate the improvements through a study would be difficult. Yeah. It, to a degree. It, it definitely would, especially like I have not read this specific study. So it also depends on what their other diet was or any of these factors of maybe they didn't change anything in their diet and they just had aloe vera, but maybe they had extremely high stress. They were on medication that could be affecting things and have all these different things in play. So I... I love research studies of they give us basis and they dig into different ingredients and supplements that we want to know about, but I always take into consideration that it's in a vacuum. And that's how it's supposed to be because you're supposed to have minimal variables here, but life doesn't have minimal variables. And so being able to look at what variables are in play in your life and what you want to give a try of, yeah, this might not have a ton of backing and research. And like you said, that by financial aspect is going to play a role because someone's got to pay for the research to happen. Um, so that's going to be one aspect of it. But then it's also going to be looking at hey, do I just want to try this and see if it works for me? And not that you should use someone saying it works for me as your guide of that means I should try it, but you get to make the decision of what you do want to try to see if it does make a change. Right. And what I would say is that as you're listening through these episodes and you are accomplishing tier one, nailing those things down, nailing tier two, nailing tier three, and looking at tier four within the supplementation, having those th first three things in place, and then potentially aloe vera being the first thing that you introduce, you may see better benefit, like more benefit in that setting, right? Because as you talked about within the study, what they were doing alongside of consuming the aloe vera is a really important piece here because the herbal medicine as a whole is, or the herbal supplementation is something where it's not going to drastically make change. It's not going to solve all of your problems. It's going to make that 0.1% improvement for you to have better digestion as a whole. And so keeping that in mind is that you have to do the most of the legwork. It's just going to give you that extra oomph as a whole. And within the overall dosage of, of aloe vera, you want to supplement with between 100 and 200 milligrams per day. This is something that you do not want to overconsume. It is going to be a very strong laxative if you accidentally uh, don't understand the measurements and you're taking 2,000 milligrams when you think that you're taking 200. So be very cognizant of the total amount that you're taking um, if you are going to give it a shot. And is this in a pill form or is it in a liquid form? What should they be looking for when they go to pick up some aloe vera? The sunburn stuff? It's going to be in a different section than what you're using for the sun sunburns, <laughs> um, but it's going to be in, in those larger containers. It's closer to a gel than a liquid, but it's not a gel and it's not just a liquid. Yeah. It's like in between those it's like two. It's thicker than water, but it's not like a, a gel as you would think of like hair gel. Like it's not right. that thickness, but it doesn't really taste like anything. It's very mild in taste and you can just kind of take it like just you would drink water and then you're all good to go. Right. And then the last one that I have for you is marshmallow root. This is a, a unique one, uh, one that has emerging uh, literature, I would say, or, or hopes to have emerging literature. This is one where uh, it's not 
able to be patented. And so the likelihood that this one gets a bunch of attention and, and gets more research is pretty slim because it's very inexpensive as a whole, uh, at least to my understanding. And so when we look at marshmallow root, it is a flowering plant that has played a role in herbal medicine for a very long time. It is high in mucilage content and when ingested will coat the digestive tract and strengthen its protective lining. And we talked about those three walls of protection to the GI tract. The first is going to be that microbiota, that healthy bacteria that we've talked about. Then following that is going to be the mucosal lining. And that is what we're going to be improving upon by supplementing with marshmallow root within the research that's been done, as well as in theory, if you will, of what the application is going to be. And then that final layer is going to be the epithelial lining. And that epithelial lining is very thin. And so we want to make the mucosal lining as well as that uh, microbiota very strong and dense so that we don't have any issues uh, within that epithelial lining because it is as thin as it is. Um, so by consuming this marshmallow root, we're going to be strengthening that second layer. As I said, the human research is limited. There is prompting, promising research within the animal research that has been conducted, but within that also there has not been any uh, side effects. So again, it's one of those supplements where we have the ability to implement, but also not experience any downside to it. Low risk. Right. It's low risk, low risk and can show benefit. So what we recommend from a dosage standpoint is a thousand to 2000 milligrams a day. If you're going to be implementing that into your protocols. Now, I noticed you didn't recommend the one that's supposed to solve all gut issues, greens. I thought greens were the magic answer to solve all of my gut issues. Why was that not included on the list? Well, Sue, if you were listening to the episode, I wanted to make a note of singular ingredients. And more often than not, greens powders are not going to be single ingredients. And so when we look at greens products as a whole, I think that there are good ones on the market. But you're putting a lot on your gut when taking them. You're introducing a lot of different components, thus oftentimes increasing the stress on the GI tract, especially early on. And so if you're going to be implementing a greens powder, I would start with like a fourth of a scoop, truly. If it's a good quality one, you find a good quality one, it has great dosages, it is being backed by the literature as a whole, start with a very low quantity of it and then slowly increase the quantity that you're taking over weeks and months and those different aspects. That's going to be, if you're going to use a, a greens powder, that's what I would recommend. Similar to that vegetable mash that we talked about, it's going to be the same approach. Yeah. And one supplement I did want to mention, which we've already talked about um, in general, is going to be magnesium. And this is one that uh, Within magnesium, it is an electrolyte and it's easily depleted by stress. So not only just everyday stress of your job or a relationship or work, whatever it may be, but if you are regularly training, that's a stress on your body and it's depleting that magnesium. And an imbalance of an electrolytes can cause some digestive issues. But what I found personally is that magnesium is a huge mover for just me having like regular digestion. And that's not even going with something like a citrate or an oxide, which are going to be very helpful if you have constipation, but just a magnesium glycinate, having that regularly in my routine has been so, so helpful. And that dosage is going to vary. I normally start off clients around 240 milligrams because the brand we recommend, the pills are 120 milligrams. So start them off with 240. For myself, I've seen benefits up to like 600 um, plus, but that's going to be very personal. And that is something I've built up over time. But I I did just want to mention that supplement because I know it's one I talk about with clients a lot. Um, but before we close out this episode, I know it's been a ton of information and a lot of really helpful information, but I just wanted to run down the last few things to consider that didn't necessarily fit into these tiers, but something that could be um, a factor in your digestion. So carbonation is going to be one of those of if you consume carbonation and you do feel like that bloated feeling or you're just feeling like 
things aren't going in the right direction. That could be something of possibly pulling out and seeing if your digestion improves. Another one is going to be chewing gum just because it's going to cause you to swallow more air and that can cause you to have more gas and some more discomfort. And especially if you're going with something like a sugar-free gum. Now, one of the other things I'm going to mention here is artificial sweeteners. And that's not to say that artificial sweeteners are the demon and you should never have them and they are just the worst for your digestion. This is something where each person's going to be different. I always like to disclaim that because I have been vocal of I don't consume artificial sweeteners, but Alex does, and he does completely fine with them. So it's going to be very dependent. I have found that people that have IBS or have like food sensitivities struggle more with artificial sweeteners. So like a sugar-free gum normally has an artificial sweetener in it or sugar-free candy or anything like that. So that that can be uh, something that you might want to look into of just taking a few things out of your your diet. And normally the things that have artificial sweeteners are, again, things that are labeled as sugar-free or a lot of supplements do have artificial sweeteners in them just so that they can keep the macros and the calories lower by having that in place. But stevia and monk fruit are ones that aren't artificial sweeteners, um, that aren't sugar, of course, but that are going to be okay um, on your digestion. Um, another thing here is going to be condiments and seasonings, as this can have just either artificial sweeteners in it, or it can have um, a few ingredients that are going to be higher FODMAP. So I found for myself that I do have a threshold for garlic with having IBS. And so a lot of condiments like garlic is one of the first thing listed on there. So again, if you've done all of this, and you're like, I'm still having some issues, it could be something like your your condiments or your seasonings or something to that degree that's worth looking into. So the last few things, um, and this is going to be some of the same within chewing gum, is drinking through a straw. I'm a huge fan of drinking through a straw, so again, not demonizing it, but it can cause you to um, swallow excess air, which can cause that discomfort as a whole. So toilet height is something I'm very passionate about because I am team squatty potty. Some toilets, you, you don't need it because it's the right toilet height for you, and that's going to be one that you can comfortably sit on without like your feet hanging off of it. But if you are having toilets in your home specifically that are way too tall, I would highly recommend looking into a squatty potty because it makes all the difference for me personally on just how I'm able to have a bowel movement and feel good in that, which also leads into a bathroom routine. A lot of times I have clients that don't give themselves time to have a bowel movement in the morning, and they're talking about being uncomfortable the rest of the day because they haven't had a bowel movement. And they might have everything else all good to go, but it could just be that they're not giving themselves enough time to have that bowel movement. Maybe they're just go, go, go in the morning. They're waking up and rushing out the door, or they just don't have a ton of time. I always recommend waking up like 10 to 20 minutes earlier just to give yourself some time. You're in a calm state that you're able to use the bathroom. And this can make all the difference for myself of if I'm going to have a good digestion day just because because I took like 15 extra minutes for myself in the morning to be in the best spot to be able to go ahead and have a bowel movement. So alcohol and cigarette use are two other ones that can just cause a lot of irritation to the gut overall and can cause a lot of digestive issues. So this isn't to say, hey, I had one drink of alcohol. This means that my digestion is just screwed. It means alcohol overconsumption. So what that's going to look like is going to be a multitude of drinks in, I believe the average amount uh, is going to be, I think it's around like four or five drinks is going to be like that overconsumption of going into that. So if you're in a place where you're regularly having like over five drinks, um, then that's going to cause that irritation when it comes to your gut. Um, and the last one's going to be travel, which I know that Alex and I have gone over quite a few times. Uh, so what does that look like or what do you talk to clients about when it comes to travel? Travel is a challenging one without preparation. And this is where being prepared and having things 
aligned for yourself is going to be huge. If you're in a situation where you're trying to run and gun it and find something at the airport before you can eat or when you land or what have you, it's probably not the best way to optimize your digestion. And so keeping yourself well hydrated, keeping things in a place where maybe you're just having a little bit of lighter meals in general is a good place to start. But I think that preparation comes so into play when we talk about optimizing digestion and travel. Right on. Well, that was a ton of information. So definitely feel free to re-listen to this episode, take some notes, and make sure you're in the best spot to have your digestion in the best spot as well. We'll catch you in the next one.